Wait for Love, Expanded Edition, written and read by P. O. Dixon. Chapter 1. Rosings Park, Kent, England, April 1811. While strolling through the park, Miss Elizabeth Bennet unexpectedly crossed paths with Mr. Darcy multiple times. It was almost becoming a habit, and a rather pleasant one at that. However, on that particular day, she was engrossed in reading Jane's latest letter, reflecting on her sister's somber tone. Alas, Jane's melancholy resulted from Mr. Charles Bingley's departure to London from Hertfordshire, which had occurred several months ago. Just as she looked up from the letter, she noticed Colonel Fitzwilliam approaching her. At about thirty, the colonel was not handsome, but he was most truly the gentleman in person and address. Elizabeth felt the full irony of the mischance that brought him to a part of the park frequented only by her and his cousin, Mr. Darcy. Indeed, a part of her was secretly hoping to happen upon the latter, for by now, as a consequence of their spending so much time in each other's company of late, he would be a little more forthcoming on the reasons for Bingley's defection. She quickly tucked away the letter and forced a smile. Colonel Fitzwilliam, I did not know you ever walked in this direction. I have been making the tour of the park, he replied, as I generally do every year, and intend to close it with a call at the parsonage. Are you going much further? No, I should have turned in a moment. And accordingly, Elizabeth turned, and they walked toward the parsonage together. Do you certainly leave Kent on Saturday? Yes, if Darcy does not put it off again. But I am at his disposal. He arranges the business just as he pleases. Elizabeth smiled knowingly. And if not able to please himself in this arrangement, he has at least pleasure in the great power of choice. I do not know anyone who seems to enjoy the power of doing what he likes more than Mr. Darcy. He likes to have his own way very well replied Colonel Fitzwilliam. But so we all do. It is only that he has better means of having it than many others because he is rich and many others are poor. I speak feelingly. A younger son, you know, must be inured to self-denial and dependence. She scoffed. I should think the younger son of an earl can know very little of either. Now seriously, what have you ever known of self-denial and dependence? When has want of money prevented you from doing whatever you choose or procuring anything you had a fancy for? These are home questions, and perhaps I cannot say that I have experienced many hardships of that nature, but I may suffer from want of money in matters of greater weight. Younger sons cannot marry where they like. Unless where they like women of fortune, which I think they very often do. Our habits of expense make us too dependent and there are very few in my rank of life who can afford to marry without some attention to money. Is this response meant for me? She colored at the idea. Recovering herself, Elizabeth said, Pray, what is the usual price of an earl's younger son? Unless the elder brother is very sickly, I suppose you would not ask above fifty thousand pounds. He answered her in the same style, and the subject dropped. Curiosity unveils truths that comfort often conceals. To interrupt a silence that might make him fancy her affected with what had passed, she soon afterwards said, I imagine your cousin brought you here with him for the sake of having a constant companion. It is strange that he is not yet married to secure a lasting arrangement of that kind. But perhaps his sister does as well for the present. And, as she is under his sole care, he may do what he likes with her. No, said Colonel Fitzwilliam, that is an advantage which he must share with me. I am joined with him in the guardianship of Miss Darcy. Are you indeed? And pray, what sort of guardians do you make? Does your charge give you very much trouble? Young ladies of her age are sometimes a little difficult to manage, she said, calling her own younger sisters to mind. And if she has a true Darcy spirit, she may like to have her own way. 
As she spoke, she observed him looking at her earnestly, and the manner in which he immediately asked her why she supposed Miss Darcy likely to give them any uneasiness convinced her that she had somehow or other got pretty near the truth. She replied directly, You need not be frightened. I never heard any harm of her. I dare say she is one of the most tractable creatures in the world. She is a very favorite with some ladies of my acquaintance, Mrs. Hurst and Miss Stingley, Elizabeth said, recalling the pernicious sisters lauding that Miss Darcy does not have an equal for beauty, elegance, and accomplishments, along with their hope of her one day being their sister. I think I've heard you say you know them. I know them a little. Their brother is a pleasant, gentlemanlike man. He is a great friend of Darcy's. Yes, Elizabeth said. Mr. Darcy is uncommonly kind to Mr. Bingley and takes a prodigious deal of care of him. Care of him? Yes, I believe Darcy does take care of him in those points where he most wants care. From something he told me on our journey hither, I have reason to believe Bingley is very much indebted to him. But I ought to beg his pardon for I have no right to suppose that Bingley was the person meant. It was all conjecture. What is it you mean? It is a circumstance which Darcy would not wish to be generally known, because if it were to get round to the lady's family, it would be an unpleasant thing. You may depend upon my not mentioning it. And remember, I have not much reason for supposing it to be Bingley. What he told me was merely this, that he congratulated himself on having lately saved a friend from the inconveniences of a most imprudent marriage, but without mentioning names or any other particulars. And I only suspected it to be Bingley from believing him the kind of young man to get into a scrape of that sort, and from knowing them to have been together the whole of last summer. Did Mr. Darcy give you reasons for his interference? Elizabeth asked, trying to ignore the sinking feeling in her stomach. I understood there were some very strong objections against the lady, he said. I cannot help but wonder what methods Mr. Darcy had used to drive a wedge between them. Was it all a ploy? Did he truly have genuine doubts about the lady's character? Or perchance his motives were more personal? Elizabeth asked, her busy mind swirling with conflicting thoughts not the least of which was the notion of his saving his friend for his sister, as the Bingley sisters had suggested. He did not talk to me of his own arts, said the colonel. He only told me what I have now told you. Elizabeth gave no reply, walking on with her heart swelling with indignation. After watching her a little, her walking companion asked her why she was so thoughtful. I am thinking of what you have been telling me. Your cousin's conduct does not suit my feelings. Why was he to be the judge? You are rather disposed to call his interference officious. I did not see what right Mr. Darcy had to decide on the propriety of his friend's inclination, or why, upon his own judgment alone, he was to determine and direct in what manner his friend was to be happy. But, she continued, recollecting herself, as we know none of the particulars, it is not fair to condemn him. It is not to be supposed there was much affection in this case. That is not an unnatural surmise, but it is a lessening of the honor of my cousin's triumph very sadly. Chapter 2 Fitzwilliam Darcy had no choice but to leave Kent. Business affairs called him back to London. The last evening he would spend in the presence of Miss Elizabeth Bennet, as merely an acquaintance from Hertfordshire, was upon him. He did not intend to miss a moment starting with watching her as she stepped from her carriage upon arriving at Rosings, Waiting outside for the Huntsford party's arrival might have been a thing to do. However, doing so would encourage premature speculation, the likes of which his aunt, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, would surely take umbrage. His noble relation's mind had long settled on the idea of his marrying her daughter, Anne. She was bound to be unhappy about his marrying Elizabeth, insisting instead that it was his obligation to his family to marry his cousin, but it could not be helped. His aunt would never comprehend that he had no obligation to anyone and was free to choose his own path. Nothing and no one would keep him from following his heart's desire, not even his family. Enjoying a private moment with Elizabeth later this evening will be challenging, 
he considered. I must find a way for us to be alone so I can declare my intentions. Once again, he glimpsed the ring resting in the palm of his hand before returning it to his small, velvet-covered box, snapping it shut and tucking it deep inside his pocket. He could hardly wait to see the look on Elizabeth's face when she beheld the dazzling diamond engagement ring. Its delay in reaching him from town bore some blame for his still being in Kent. He poured himself a drink and then took a seat near the window. If events unfolded as he expected, a long, promising night awaited him, one he would surely cherish for the rest of his life. Upon finishing his drink, Darcy set his stone-cut crystal glass aside. His plans for Elizabeth were heavy on his mind. He had awakened that morning with such vivid dreams of knowing her in all the ways. A man violently in love knew his wife. His heart raced with anticipation as he contemplated declaring his intentions. A wave of exhilaration washed over him, imagining the moment he would finally express his affection. The thought of a swift marriage by special license filled him with eager longing. He envisioned tender moments shared in their union's bliss, cherishing their deep connection. In his mind, they would be inseparable, devoted entirely to each other in a bond unbroken by any external force. He gently closed his eyes, surrendering to the soft caress of his daydreams, allowing their soothing ways to carry him closer to the blissful future he so dearly wished to begin. After a while, clock bills ringing in the distance aroused Darcy. He sat up straight and tall and consulted his pocket watch. Elizabeth's party was due to arrive from the parsonage at any minute. Before joining everyone in the drawing room, he wanted to glimpse his future bride in privacy. Admiring her beauty was one of his favorite pastimes, although he was forced to admit it had not always been that way, the fool that he was. Upon first seeing her in Hertfordshire, he described her as tolerable and not handsome enough to tempt him. But that was before he really looked at her and grew fascinated by her fine eyes, dark and bewitching, and her figure, light and pleasing. He soon regarded Elizabeth as one of the most handsome women of his acquaintance and then as the woman with whom he would spend the rest of his life. In truth, Darcy had suffered his fair share of reservations about embarking on his chosen path. There was the matter of Elizabeth's family, which bothered him so much that he had persuaded his close friend Charles Bingley to be wary of an alliance with the eldest Bennet daughter. Here was a family with no fortune, no connection, and severely wanting in decorum. Although he excused Elizabeth from such deficits, he would have been a fool to suppose society would also look askance at the disparity in the Bennett family station in life compared to his own. In vain I have struggled, and to no avail. I love her most ardently. No other woman in the world exists for me. Elizabeth is everything to me. The sound of Lady Catherine's carriage in the distance dragged him to his feet. He stood at the window and peered down the drive, excited by the prospect of watching Elizabeth alight. Mr. William Collins, Lady Catherine's sycophant vicar and Elizabeth's cousin, descended first. He was a tall, fat man with a florid face and a greasy exterior. His clothing was ill-fitted and ill-maintained. How could anyone take such a man seriously? Mrs. Charlotte Collins, Elizabeth's intimate friend, quit the carriage next, smiling at the attending coachman. Darcy waited with bated breath for a much-desired glimpse of Elizabeth at which point he planned to hurry to her side in the drawing room. Darcy waited. He watched. He wondered. What was taking so long? Why had she not come out yet? His heart beat wildly as the carriage pulled away. Where is Elizabeth? Insulting a lady's family is the surest means of tripping over that fine line between love and hate. It was for the best that she did not go to Rosings with the Collinses that evening. By now, she had had her fill of the haughty Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Time spent in her ladyship's company often required a defensive posture on Elizabeth's part, as the former never tired of insinuating herself into everyone's business, Elizabeth's family, the business of Longbourn in particular. That evening, however, avoiding Lady Catherine was not Elizabeth's primary aim. Rather, at that moment, her fury was directed toward Lady Catherine's nephew, Mr. Darcy, over what he allegedly had done. As enraged as Elizabeth had been at hearing all Mr. Darcy's foul conduct, she maintained her reserve until she and the colonel parted ways. Hours later, the dark mood that the unfeeling 
arrogant Mr. Darcy had brought on lingered with Elizabeth, and as if intending to exasperate herself as much as possible against the officious man. Elizabeth chose for her employment the examination of all the letters her sister Jane had written to her since her being in Kent. Jane's spirits were as low as ever, and now Elizabeth had confirmation of what she had suspected all along, even if there was a time or two of late when she wished with all her heart she was wrong. According to the colonel's testimony, Mr. Darcy had conspired to separate his friend Charles Bingley from Jane all those months ago. Just like that, all the goodwill Mr. Darcy had garnered with Elizabeth during his stay in Kent, despite the string of deficits he had amassed while they were in Hertfordshire, was gone. All the occasions they accidentally met in the lanes when he would turn and walk with her, the good-natured banter they shared, often at his expense, Every incidental brush of his hand, everything had amounted to this. We are no better off now than we were when he left Hertfordshire. No, we are much worse off. Now he has given me sufficient cause to dislike him over a hundredfold. It was some consolation to think his visit to Rosen's was to end the next day, and a greater comfort that in less than a fortnight she should be with her dearest sister again and enabled to contribute to the recovery of her spirits. Poor Jane. All Elizabeth's fanciful notions of how it would be once Bingley reunited with her dearest sister and returned to Netherfield Park, conceivably with Mr. Darcy as a future guest, had been for naught. Long strolls about the countryside, chance encounters at Netherfield, dinners at Longbourn, who was to say what their futures might have entailed? Now Elizabeth did not care if she ever laid eyes on Mr. Darcy again. She surely did not mean to be unhappy about him. Elizabeth had barely settled this point in her mind when the bell rang sharply, announcing someone's arrival at the house. She soon heard footsteps in the hallway, and her spirits were a little disturbed by the idea of it being Mr. Darcy himself, for he had given the strongest hint of wanting to see her at Rosen's that evening. Unfortunately, this idea was soon confirmed, and her composure was severely affected when she saw the gentleman walk into the room. In a hurried manner, he immediately began an inquiry after her health, imputing his visit to a wish of hearing that she was better. Elizabeth could not think of anything but her sister's injuries and what might have been his part in them. How dare he inquire about my health when his offenses against my sister are the reasons for my distress? She tried to keep her voice level to contain her rage, but it seeped out as she answered him with cold civility. He paused for a moment as though confused by her reaction, and then he sat down for a few moments before returning to his feet and pacing about the room. Mr. Darcy behaved strangely, giving Elizabeth a prickly feeling down her neck. She could barely keep herself from shouting at him for being so rude. He walked about the parlor, as restless as a boar in a pen, but instead of pacing back and forth, he kept moving from place to place, never staying in one for more than a few seconds. After a silence of several minutes, he came toward her. Mr. Darcy retrieved something from the breast pocket of his jacket. Chapter 3 Elizabeth stared at the velvet box Mr. Darcy held before her. A lengthy moment passed before the realization of his intentions dawned on her. He kneeled on one knee, rendering her speechless and immobile in surprise. His hands trembled as he opened the box revealing a sparkling diamond ring. The significance of the moment left her mute, her thoughts scrambling as he began to speak. In vain I have struggled. It will not do. My love for you is such that I dare not wait a moment longer. Completely flushed and confused, Elizabeth's shock was such that it was impossible for her to remain silent. Mr. Darcy, pray, what are you doing? Wide-eyed, Elizabeth looked at him with the most profound astonishment. Pray, return to your feet immediately least anyone discovers the two of us. Mr. Darcy obeyed and stood, his face serious. For too long, I have kept silent about my feelings, he said firmly. I mean for the world to know how ardently I admire and love you. Elizabeth shook her head. You, you love me, sir? She felt her cheeks flush with embarrassment. When, precisely, did you discover that, dare I ask? I cannot fix on the hour or the spot or the look or the words which laid the foundation. It is too long ago. I was in the middle before I knew I had begun. Elizabeth had no words. She only stared at Darcy in wonder. His revelation was met with a stillness 
that seemed to stretch into eternity, marked only by the passing of mere seconds. She was at a complete loss to know what to think or how to feel. Do not look so alarmed, said Mr. Darcy. Surely my love for you is no surprise. Repeatedly, I put off my return to town, but for one reason, that being you. Every moment spent in your company has been among the most precious in my life. Our long walks, time spent at Rosings, and even in this room. That is to say nothing of our intimate talks. Intimate? She wondered how he could think so. I would not characterize the string of puzzling statements made by you as intimate, she further considered. It was as if he had concocted a vision of their past, replete with wooing, courtship, and violent romance. Indeed, nothing akin to the budding feelings she had nurtured toward him since being in Kent. Elizabeth frowned a little. On the other hand, he seemed to suggest that the next time I am here, I will stay at Rosings. He even went so far as to draw me into speaking on the Collins's marriage. The specifics of that particular discussion came to her mind. Mr. Collins appears to be very fortunate in his choice of a wife, Mr. Darcy had said. Yes, indeed, his friends may well rejoice in his having met with one of the few sensible women who would have accepted him or made him happy if they had. My friend has an excellent understanding, though I am not certain I consider her marrying Mr. Collins the wisest thing she ever did. She seems perfectly happy, however, and in a prudential light, it is certainly a very good match for her. It must be very agreeable for her to be settled within so easy a distance of her family and friends. An easy distance, do you call it? It is nearly fifty miles. And what is fifty miles of good road? had been Mr. Darcy's response. Little more than a half-day's journey. Yes, I call it a very easy distance. I should never have considered the distance as one of the advantages of the match, cried Elizabeth. I should have never said Mrs. Collins was settled near her family. It is proof of your attachment to Hertfordshire. Anything beyond the very neighborhood of Longbourn, I suppose, would appear far. She recalled thinking at the time he had spoken. There was a sort of smile that Elizabeth fancied she understood. He must have supposed her to be thinking of Jane and Netherfield. I was wrong, Elizabeth was forced to consider, recalling herself to the present. Mr. Darcy has never given a thought to my Jane at all. Else he would never have interfered in her happiness as he did. The discrepancy between what she was hearing and what she was thinking was too much. Elizabeth stared, colored, doubted, and was silent. This he considered sufficient encouragement, and the avowal of all that he felt followed. I have never met a woman like you, said the gentleman. I have been searching for you my entire life. I no longer can imagine my life without you, he continued. Our time together in Hertfordshire persuaded me I was in grave danger of falling in love with you. These past weeks merely confirmed that, which deep in my heart I already knew, that there is no one else for me but you. You are everything to me, the love of my life. Eloquently spoken words on the subject of love must surely linger forever in a lady's mind. A voracious reader of books in general, and romance novels in particular, who regularly enjoyed long, leisurely walks in the park with a man such as Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth could not help but fancifully reflect on the occasion from time to time. What an inauspicious time for Elizabeth, as such reflection crept into her busy mind while Mr. Darcy spoke of his reasons for loving her as much as he did. Having wandered off the usual path, Elizabeth found herself amid a field of wildflowers, their scent smelling sweeter than any perfume. Mr. Darcy stood particularly close to her. His voice sounded warm and tender as he spoke, giving Elizabeth leave to relish in the possibilities their situation entailed. Let me teach you the ways of love, my dearest, he said, while threading a flower in her loosened locks. His nearness, his warm breath against her skin, sent waves of desire throughout her body. Once the flower was securely in her hair, they gazed into each other's eyes. She turned her face to his and let out a soft sigh. She lifted her head and raised her eyebrows. Elizabeth knew the look in his eyes well enough. Perhaps I might teach you a thing or two, she teased. No doubt where matters of the heart are concerned, you can teach me a great deal. Let me say I am eager to learn. Mr. Darcy leaned forward and placed his finger underneath her chin. Elizabeth shuddered with pleasure. Their eyes held fixed. His dark eyes mesmerized hers. He leaned forward and brushed lingering yet gentle kisses along her neckline. Elizabeth's passion swelled. Soft moans escaped her as she shivered at his touch. Let this be a moment I shall treasure always. 
He smiled, no doubt delighted by her response. His lips eased toward hers. Mr. Darcy uttered, Teach me. Elizabeth shook her head, silently chastising herself for entertaining inappropriate thoughts at such a time, thoughts best reserved for privacy. Her cheeks burned with embarrassment. How fortunate for me that the gentleman cannot read my mind. Returning her full attention to her companion, Elizabeth detected eloquence in his speech she had never imagined possible, as he recounted the many reasons he loved her so ardently, and she could not hide her astonishment. His words and looks, beaming with kindness and love, spoke of a deep and abiding admiration. He spoke of having traveled so many places, throughout the country and even the continent, and how he had never met a woman as wonderful as her. For many years, he never believed he would find someone like her. He spoke no less of his admiration for her mind, how it fascinated him, her exuberance of spirit, wit, charm, and everything about her were what he missed in his life. He spoke of his belief that she would fall in love with her future home in Derbyshire, and that she would indeed flourish as the new mistress of Pemberley. Can this be Mr. Darcy? He spoke words of love so movingly that Elizabeth could not help but listen. The melodic rhythm of his lovemaking almost made Elizabeth forget what she was about, almost, until he said, Please do me the honor of accepting my hand. Chapter 4 Sir, in such cases as this, it is the established mode to express the sense of obligation for the sentiments of doubt, however unequally they may be returned. It is natural that obligation should be felt. And if I could feel gratitude, I would now thank you, but I cannot. Mr. Darcy's complexion became pale, and the disturbance of his mind was visible in every feature. He was struggling for the appearance of composure and would not open his lips till he believed himself to have attained it. The pause was to Elizabeth's feelings dreadful. At length, he said, and this is the reply I am to have the honor of receiving. I might perhaps wish to be informed why, with so little endeavor at civility, I am thus rejected. How can I but reject your offer, considering what you have done? What have I done? You dare not. You cannot deny. You have been the principal, if not the only means, of dividing my sister Jane and Mr. Bingley from each other of exposing one to the censure of the world for caprice and instability, and the other to its derision for disappointed hopes, and involving both in misery of the acutest kind. She paused and saw, with no slight indignation, that he was listening with an air that proved him wholly unmoved by any feelings of remorse. On the contrary, he even looked at her with a smile of affected incredulity. Elizabeth's eyes narrowed as she stared at him in disbelief. Can you deny that you have done it? she repeated. With the some tranquility, he said, I have no wish of denying that I did everything in my power to separate my friend from your sister, or that I rejoice in my success. Toward him I have been kinder than toward myself. Elizabeth disdained the appearance of noticing this civil reflection, but its meaning did not escape her, nor was it likely to conciliate her. Perhaps you should have thought better of yourself too, sir. Surely you should have thought better of me. Then both of us might have been spared this farce, she argued. Elizabeth, she gasped. She could not help it. How dare you refer to me so familiarly, sir. Please, refrain from doing so. Call me Miss Elizabeth. Better still, call me Miss Bennet, as propriety dictates in this situation. I shall not pretend you and I are little more than casual acquaintances. I offered you my hand in marriage. It is my intention to spend the rest of my life with you. You willingly confess to be in the means of disappointing the hopes of a most beloved sister. Am I to ignore such a grievous offense? When they were last together at Netherfield, I watched your sister with my friend. Her look and manners were open, cheerful, and engaging as ever, but without any symptom of particular regard. From the evening scrutiny, I remained convinced that though your sister received Bingley's attentions with pleasure, she did not invite them by any participation of sentiment. That is merely Jane's way. She rarely shows her true feelings to anyone. Your friend's defection pained her beyond measure. He shrugged. I was merely acting in service of my friend. And what of my family? Our low connections and want of fortune. Are these not deficiencies that, in your own opinion, made Jane unworthy of your friend? 
I do not deny having given some thought to the inferiority of your connections compared to my own. However, any struggles I may have suffered paled compared to the struggle I face not having you in my life. The prospect of facing such a world is not one I wish to endure. Elizabeth rose from her seat and headed to the window. She stared out into the darkness, one arm folded over the other. She gazed up at the sky, trying to make sense of the unfolding events. The stars were shining brighter than usual. She closed her eyes and held her breath. Was the universe merely mocking her? How ironic that she should receive two marriage proposals in the span of a few months, both offers from gentlemen who acted as though they expected her to rejoice at the prospect. My rejection of Mr. Collins's hand caused my mother to vow never to speak to me again, although her words proved little more than an idle threat. I do not imagine she would ever forgive me if I refused such a man as Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy, a man who, Elizabeth's attention, finally came back to the guests when the sound of his voice pierced her reverie. She spun around. She tried not to gasp aloud. Mr. Darcy stood mere inches away. Her eyes fell on his slightly parted lips, his dark eyes, and once again on his lips. How long has he been standing there? Despite her aggrieved sensibilities, due to the pain he had caused her dearest sister, Elizabeth was not insensitive to the tempting allure of the man standing so close by. She always liked the way he smelled, always so fresh, so masculine. It was though reason and desire were warring factions inside her. Elizabeth's mind wandered to a dream she once had, a meeting with Mr. Darcy in Rosens Park. She was strolling along a garden path with him, admiring the colorful flowers and sculptured hedges. Mr. Darcy had been a consummate gentleman, resting her hand lightly on his arms as he led her through the grounds. His smile came easier than in wakeful moments, his eyes glinting with warmth in the afternoon sun. Laughter flowed freely between them in their lively debate over the merits of Bach versus Mozart. He was uncharacteristically talkative as they admired the splendid garden, speaking of his favorite poetry and how Pemberley's own gardens filled him with nostalgia from boyhood adventures. In return, Elizabeth shared her hopes of someday filling her own home with love and laughter. She found herself admitting things she had told no one else. With gentle attentiveness, Mr. Darcy made her feel, indeed, seen and understood. When Elizabeth had stopped to admire a marble fountain, Mr. Darcy stood close behind her, pointing over her shoulder at intricacies in the sculpting she might otherwise have missed. She leaned into him ever so slightly, comforted by his reassuring presence. Stopping beneath a canopied archway wrapped in roses, he took her hand and thanked her sincerely for the pleasure of her company. His touch sparked an unfamiliar longing within Elizabeth to linger a moment more. Standing at the window now, she felt bewildered by this dream that seemed so real. She marveled at the genuine companionship enjoyed in this dream. Seeing a sight of Mr. Darcy, she had never glimpsed in waking life. Could there be more sincerity to Mr. Darcy than she had realized? It was but a reverie, and yet Elizabeth could not deny the leap of her pulse at the memory. Elizabeth searched for traces of the vulnerable man in her dreams. Part of her yearned to reconcile the two contrary images in her mind, the tender companion who had accompanied her in her dreams, to the gentleman standing before her, the man whose selfish disdain for the feelings of others had been the means of bringing unwarranted suffering to her family and likely so many others. Sir, Elizabeth began, it is not merely this affair on which my objection is founded. Your pride, your officiousness I cannot overlook. Your character was unfolded in the recital I received many months ago from Mr. Wickham. What can you say on this subject? And what imaginary act of friendship can you defend yourself? You take an eager interest in that gentleman's concerns, said Mr. Darcy, in a less tranquil tone and with heightened color. Who that knows what his misfortunes have been can help but feel an interest in him? Elizabeth saw that fierce expression of his. Here was the arrogant gentleman, whom she had detested when they were in Hertfordshire. Welcome back, Mr. Darcy. His misfortunes, he repeated contemptuously. Yes, his misfortunes have been great indeed. The way he said it made Elizabeth's temper rise. And of your infliction, she cried with energy, 
You have reduced him to his present state of poverty, comparative poverty. You have withheld the advantages you know to have been designed for him. You have deprived the best years of his life of that independence that was no less his due than his desert. You have done all this, and yet you can treat the mention of his misfortune with contempt and ridicule? And this, cried Darcy, is your opinion of me. This is the estimation in which you hold me. Elizabeth felt herself growing ill with every passing moment. That she should receive an offer of marriage from Mr. Darcy, that he should have held her in his heart for so long, so much in love as to wish to marry her, despite all the objections that had made him prevent his friends marrying her sister. It was almost incredible. It was gratifying to have inspired unconsciously so strong an affection. But his avowal of what he had done regarding Jane, his unpardonable assurance in acknowledging it, though he could not justify it, and the unfeeling manner in which he had mentioned Mr. Wickham, his cruelty toward whom he had not attempted to deny, soon overcame the pity that the consideration of his attachment had for a moment excited. Elizabeth had used the excuse of having a headache to avoid going to Rosings. However, the actual reason for her vexation was standing before her. Now she could really feel a headache coming on. That, or extreme exasperation, either of the two was too great to ignore. She closed her eyes and rubbed her forehead. This is not the best time for us to have this discussion, sir. I think you should leave. The gentleman spoke not a word. He turned away. With long strides, he headed toward the door. Her mission to send Mr. Darcy on his way was moments from accomplishment. Relief, confusion, and disbelief twisted and turned in her stomach. Mr. Darcy was mere footsteps from the door, his hand reaching for the knob, and then he stopped. The next moment, he turned on his heel and retraced his steps. Neither my character nor my heart will allow me to walk away from you before seeking to redress all your claims against me, he began, his voice softening. I know you to be a staunch defender of those you feel have suffered unjustly. Pray you will extend that same courtesy to me by listening to what I have to say. Elizabeth surely prided herself on being fair-minded. Here was a man who had professed his undying love for her, a gentleman of immense wealth, blessed with all that mortal hearts could desire, a grand estate, noble lineage, and influential connections. Not that his wealth tempted her, but rather he was the best friend of her sister's love interests. In addition, he exhibited none of those propensities that had marked him for earlier disapprobation while in Kent. As for her dearest sister, who knew better than Elizabeth herself that Jane rarely showed her true feelings to anyone? As for Wickham, had she not based all her objections to Mr. Darcy on the former's sole testimony? No one else had ever spoken ill of Mr. Darcy, certainly no one in the Netherfield party. His cousin, the colonel, whose opinion Elizabeth trusted, spoke highly of Mr. Darcy, too. Elizabeth said, I suppose I would be remiss not to listen to what you have to say, sir. With that, she returned to the couch and sat. Time stood still as Mr. Darcy composed himself. At length, he said, I never meant to cause you or your family harm. Your superior knowledge of your sister must indeed prove I was mistaken about her feelings for Bingley. For that, I must apologize from the depths of my heart. I have loved you for so long. It is only right that I should do everything in my power to prove myself to be a man worthy of pleasing you. As regards your elder sister, I shall do all I can to help reunite her and my friend Bingley. I can well imagine my words having some sway. I further resolve, if given the chance, to pay off every deficit of civility I have ever shown your family. You have my promise. As for the two of us, everything that is mine will be yours. Just believe in me. And as for the other charge you made regarding my character, I feel it is incumbent that we address it once and for all. Mr. Wickham, said Elizabeth, standing. She drifted toward the window once again. Mr. Darcy nodded. It pains me beyond reason knowing the extent of your regard for that man. It annoys me to utter distraction when you speak of him so favorably. Just because I did not refute his allegations against me when we were in Hertfordshire does not make him unassailable. Trust me, Miss Elizabeth, he is not worthy. Why do you hate him so? Hate him? Whatever my feelings may be, I did not always feel this way. He and I were reared together at Pembley. We were friends. 
Wickham might have told you he was my father's godson, that my father loved him. He bequeathed him the living in Kempton once it became available. No doubt Wickham told you all this. Elizabeth nodded. I am sure he did not tell you he refused the living. He came to me asking for money instead. I dared not object. He and I knew he was ill-suited for such a life, so I gave him three thousand pounds, which he soon squandered, living beyond his means in London. When he came to Pemberley demanding more, I refused him, and in no uncertain terms, which resulted in an exchange filled with such vitriol as to guarantee no further communication between us. Mr. Darcy ran his fingers through his hair. Only Wickham had other plans. He attempted to elope with my sister, Georgiana, a young girl of fifteen, nearly half his age. His motive was twofold, gaining control of Georgiana's dowry and striking a severe blow against me. Had he succeeded, his revenge would have been complete. It pained Elizabeth to hear Mr. Darcy's accounting of the events that led to him saving his sister from a scandal and a lifetime of heartbreak. How could I have been so mistaken about Mr. Wickham's character? She wondered if she even knew herself. Her mind in turmoil, she drifted away from the window. Walking toward the sofa, Elizabeth felt a slight brush on the small of her back, Mr. Darcy's touch, but only for an instant. Elizabeth bit her lower lip. Sir, I am so sorry, she said. Her voice softened, laced with contrition. How can I make amends? Taking a seat not too far from where Elizabeth sat, Mr. Darcy said, You owe me nothing. We might have avoided this misunderstanding if I had been more open with you from the start. Crossing one leg over the other, he brushed invisible lint from his tan trousers. He had not come all this way to garner Elizabeth's pity, or even her gratitude for that matter. I came here, intending to win her hand in marriage, that we might announce our intention before my family, then to hers, and ultimately to the rest of the world. Long nights of tossing and turning of late had come to this. Past dreams of taking her in his arms each night flooded his mind. Their every burst of shared passion likened to the first, explosive, satiating, utterly divine. Shattered hopes, his meticulous plans for their future felicity, their hearts beating as one, all for naught. Was this to be his fate and life, an unrequited love, night after night with a phantom lover his sole companion? The mere thought of such an existence threatened to rob him of his composure. He closed his eyes for a few moments and rubbed his forehead. It will not do. Miss Elizabeth, he said, you have bewitched me, body and soul. In my heart, there exists an affection devoted solely unto you. We belong together. I have waited this long to tell you how I feel, perhaps too long, I fear. I dare not presume I have entirely reversed the tide of your ill feelings toward me in the course of an evening. However, you are too generous to trifle with me. If, Having listened to what I have said, your feelings are the same as before. Pray, tell me now. One word from you will silence me on this subject forever. Her silence encouraged him to draw nearer. Elizabeth sat with one hand resting over the other in her lap. Darcy reached out to her. He placed his hand on hers and gave it a gentle caress. She might have eased away, but she did not, and thus taught Darcy to hope. If, on the other hand, I have persuaded you of the depths of my affection for you, I will have to say, I wish never to be parted from you. I want to spend my life with you, and I will wait for you, so long as I am not waiting in vain. A lady dares not trifle with a man's emotion when what is at stake is ardent love and devotion. That evening, Mr. Darcy had shown himself to be just what a gentleman ought to be. Of course, he has always been that way. It was only me who was too blind to see. What was more, his tender words had proved him to be worthy, indeed, everything a man who was violently in love ought to be. She could not forget the affinity the previous night dream had instilled, as if she had lived that garden walk herself. Could reality ever align with such a dream? And had it not been for a chance encounter with Colonel Fitzwilliam, would Mr. Darcy's proposal not have satisfied her own secret wishes? Dare I try to deny it? I will one day be this man's wife. This man will be my husband, my one and only lover for all eternity. Smiling, she raised his hand to her lips and brushed her lingering kiss on his knuckles. There was a warmth about him, a gentle, reassuring, and comforting air no longer lost on her. Let the lessons begin. Miss Elizabeth, 
Mr. Darcy, she said, touching his lips. She leaned ever so close, close enough to appreciate the subtle hints of his cologne. Finally, she whispered, please call me Elizabeth. Chapter 5 As Elizabeth stood before the mirror in Charlotte's parlor, she felt a pang of self-doubt and uncertainty. Her sense of self was now shattered. The image reflected at her, a mere shadow of the person she long supposed herself to be. It was no longer the confident and carefree Miss Bennet who looked back with unshakable self-assurance. Elizabeth barely recognized this woman. For how could this be the same woman who had always refused to conform to society's expectations, now wearing a ring on her finger, from a man she had sworn on more than one occasion to loathe until the end of time? She saw a shell of a woman, haunted by her own actions and choices. She had made a decision that went against everything she had ever believed in by accepting this man. How could she have gone against her principles? Had she truly succumbed to societal pressure? Or was there a deeper reason behind her acceptance? These thoughts danced in a tumultuous waltz through her mind as she endeavored to come to terms with the stranger and the mirror. Elizabeth had never been more conflicted in all her life. What on earth have I done? No doubt her mother would be thrilled upon learning that Elizabeth was betrothed to a gentleman of 10,000 pounds a year. After all, it was every mother's dream to see her daughter marry into such wealth and status. But what about her father? whose opinion meant everything to Elizabeth. Would he think she was out of her senses for accepting Mr. Darcy's proposal? Then there was the matter of persuading him that she had indeed made a rational decision in agreeing to marry Mr. Darcy. How can I persuade him that I know what I am about in agreeing to marry Mr. Darcy, when I can scarcely account for it myself? Elizabeth knew her father valued her intelligence and independence above all else. He had always encouraged her to think for herself and stand by her principles, even if it meant going against the dictates of others. How would he react when he learned that his headstrong daughter had chosen to marry a man she had once despised? Catching sight of her friend Charlotte's reflection, Elizabeth drew in a deep breath as though summoning her courage and turned to greet her friend after slipping the engagement ring from her finger and tucking it inside her pocket. Though she had been the one to insist her understanding with Mr. Darcy remain a secret between the two of them, Elizabeth absolutely needed to confide in someone. Besides her dearest sister Jane, who was better than Charlotte, who would undoubtedly detect the truth of it all the moment she was in company with Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy again. Charlotte inquired about Elizabeth's health and hoped she was feeling better. Charlotte also said, I understand we had the pleasure of an evening caller. Mrs. Hunter took it upon herself to inform me that Mr. Darcy was here. Dare I ask what the purpose of his visit was? I can only assume he was concerned for your health. Dear Charlotte, as for Mr. Darcy's visit, I want nothing more than to share everything with you. But I can only do so if you vow to repeat it to no one, not even your husband, Mr. Collins, especially not to Mr. Collins. Elizabeth, you know you can tell me anything. How often have we vowed to carry our most closely held secrets to our graves? If only this were as inconsequential as our girlish musings. I fear the consequences if it were discovered that you knew what I need to confide and kept it to yourself. Elizabeth, what has happened? Does this secret have anything to do with Mr. Darcy's visiting you? Did Mr. Darcy propose to me? Charlotte's eyes widened and her face was filled with joy. Is that not a cause for celebration? Why do you insist it is a great secret? A look of concern overtook her features. Pray, do not tell me you refused his offer of marriage, she exclaimed, her voice trembling with worry and dismay. No, on the contrary. Well, initially I refused his offer. Charlotte's eyes widened, and she gasped before quickly composing herself. Oh, Elizabeth, she whispered sympathetically. Again, I said initially. But then I allowed myself to be persuaded into agreeing to marry the gentleman. Only, now, I am not so sure I was not simply swept up in the moment. Oh, Charlotte, you better than anyone know I have always suffered strong reservations for Mr. Darcy. And once supposed him to be the last man in the world, I could be prevailed on to marry. And yet, during the course of a few scant hours, I ignored all that and agreed to become his wife. Tears welled up in Elizabeth's eyes as she finally allowed herself to feel the gravity of her decision. Charlotte touched Elizabeth's shoulder and said, Whatever your reasons may be, 
I know they were not made lightly. I will support you no matter what. Hastily spoken words once escaped cannot be unsaid or unheard. As Charlotte's words washed over her, Elizabeth felt a weight lift from her shoulders. She was grateful for her friend's understanding and support during this difficult time. Charlotte, I cannot claim a true understanding of my motives or my heart in this matter, but I am sure what I may or may not feel for him does not equate to love, Elizabeth confessed, her distress evident as she wrung her hands. I acted hastily, allowing my sentiments to sweep me along in the heat of the moment, but in the light of day, I admit, I do not know Mr. Darcy well enough to promise him my hand without reservations. There now, do not fret so. Marriage founded on esteem and respect may nurture affection in time. Not all matches begin as grand romances. In espousing this sentiment, Charlotte was indeed speaking from her heart. Her own marriage to Mr. Collins was evidence of that. Charlotte did not seem as unhappy as Elizabeth had feared she would be. Her demeanor did not betray any signs of misery or regret. On the contrary, Charlotte appeared as contented in life as she had ever been. Elizabeth remembered how she had initially reacted to the news of Charlotte's engagement. She felt a pang of guilt, recognizing how wanting was her support for Charlotte's decision, and part of her wished she had been a better friend. You know my feelings on this subject, Charlotte continued. In such matters as this, what does love have to do with it? Shall you sit around and wait for love for some indeterminate time and possibly miss the chance for happiness and security? I sincerely wish that what you are interpreting as a change of heart is merely a case of nerves. Wait until you meet with the gentleman before you make any decisions. I am sure you will know how to act after you have had a chance to discuss this with him. You have always been a loyal friend, Charlotte, Elizabeth replied, embracing the other woman. Miss Elizabeth. Elizabeth felt Charlotte startle and spun to face the parlor entrance. In the doorway stood Mr. Darcy, one hand still resting on the brass doorknob. His brooding eyes were fixed intently on Elizabeth, a crease between his brows. Mortification flooding her veins like ice, Elizabeth swayed unsteadily. The knot in her stomach tightened to near agony as she fully registered the situation. Mr. Darcy had arrived unexpectedly early and undoubtedly had heard enough to surmise her conflicted feelings about accepting his proposal. Mr. Darcy, Charlotte exclaimed, recovering herself quicker. What a pleasant surprise to receive you this morning. Her friend's voice sounded distant to Elizabeth's ears. She could not tear her eyes away from her betrothed, stern face. What must he think after overhearing her distressing confessions? Did he regret asking for her hand? An awful silence pervaded the room as Darcy continued studying Elizabeth, his countenance frustratingly unreadable. Try as she might, no words formed on Elizabeth's tongue. The heat of embarrassment spread like fire across her cheeks. At last, Darcy moved toward her his footsteps echoing loudly in the hush. Miss Elizabeth, he repeated softly, I believe we have much to discuss. Chapter 6 The image of Elizabeth's stricken face upon seeing him standing in the doorway haunted him. He had arrived early, only to halt in dismay outside the parlor doors as feminine voices drifted into the hall. The words he overheard had shaken him profoundly. Though Darcy had kept his composure in the moment, inwardly, her revelations left him reeling. Can it be true? Does Elizabeth truly harbor such profound doubts about accepting my proposal? She had spoken of not understanding her own heart, of acting in reckless haste in the throes of heightened sentiment. His pulse quickened anxiously. Had she only accepted his offer in a fleeting moment of caprice? Was her uncertainty merely the natural hesitation of an independent woman contemplating such a profound change in status? Surely with time and his steadfast devotion, he could wash away any lingering questions about their union. Darcy was no stranger to the paralyzing uncertainty of new love. Surely there was hope to be found in her candid admission to Mrs. Collins. At least Elizabeth cared enough to voice her concerns rather than enter their union lightly. It was better to address any reservations now than let them fester unspoken. He would convince his Elizabeth of the rightness between them. He would gladly open his heart and soul to her, holding nothing back. Our marriage will bloom into the relationship destiny always intended. Elizabeth agreed to Mr. Darcy's offer of a morning walk, intuitively understanding their mutual need for seclusion 
to converse about the unfolding events. He guided her through the duke-hissed meadow to a hidden knoll, revealing a panorama that seemed to leap from the pages of a romantic tale. Below them, the landscape unfolded in lush splendor, crowned by a structure reminiscent of the Temple of Apollo, its neoclassic elegance a striking contrast against the pastoral beauty. A tranquil lake lay in the vicinity, embraced by the graceful arc of a stone bridge, the water's surface mirroring the serenity of the morning sky. To Elizabeth's astonishment, the crest of the hill revealed Mr. Darcy's thoughtful preparation, an intimate breakfast setting on a soft blanket adorned with an array of delectable fare, alongside blooming flowers and fine linens, all arranged with impeccable taste. Mr. Darcy, with a gesture of refined courtesy, invited her to sit. Please, make yourself comfortable, he said, his voice infusing the air with an unspoken promise of heartfelt dialogue amid the picturesque beauty of their secluded retreat. As they settled onto the comforting blanket, the soft murmur of the countryside enveloped them. Mr. Darcy's eyes met Elizabeth's, conveying a depth of emotion that spoke volumes. I must confess, he began, I did not expect you to embrace the notion of our engagement as wholeheartedly as I have. My love for you has been a constant companion for so long, a dream from which I feared to awaken. In my heart, I have envisioned a future with you, one filled with shared joys and boundless affection. He paused, searching her eyes for understanding. I know your feelings may need time to flourish to match the intensity of my own, and I am prepared, nay determined, to devote every waking hour to reassuring you, to prove that our union as husband and wife is not merely a fanciful wish, but a destiny meant to be fulfilled. As Elizabeth listened to Mr. Darcy's heartfelt words, she felt her heart soften toward him. She had long admired his strength and intelligence, but now she was beginning to see the tenderness and vulnerability beneath his proud exterior, those amiable qualities that always defined him in her dreams. She reached out to take his hand in hers, a gesture of comfort and understanding. I appreciate your honesty and your determination, she said. You have shown me such kindness and generosity amid my reservations and uncertainties, and despite my previous prejudices against you. Mr. Darcy's eyes twinkled with gratitude as he gently grasped her hand. It is my utmost desire to see you happy, Elizabeth, he replied genuinely, and I am prepared to wait for eternity, if need be, until your love matches mine. Elizabeth could not help but smile at his sincerity. I dare say we have much yet to discover about each other, she said, but I am more than willing to embark on this journey with you, that is to say, if you will still have me. A brilliant smile spread across Mr. Darcy's face as he leaned closer. I would consider it an honor, he whispered. Elizabeth, her heart fluttering at his assertion, ventured a question lingering in her mind. And what of your plans after leaving Kent? When do you intend to return? Mr. Darcy's response came with a surprising yet resolute determination. I mean to get a special license as soon as I arrive in London. It is my sincere hope that, with your father's blessing, we shall be able to marry soon after. I wish for nothing more than to begin our life together without delay. True Love's Course Navigates the Delicate Dance Between Decorum and Desire Elizabeth's thoughts then turned to another matter close to her heart. When you are in London, will you speak to Mr. Bingley to clarify the misunderstanding regarding my sister Jane's affections? She asked. It would mean a great deal to her. And to me. Mr. Darcy, his expression pensive, nodded slowly. I shall endeavor to do what I can for your sister and Mr. Bingley, he assured her. However, I must confess, I would be loath to think that their destiny is entwined with our own. Our path, Elizabeth, is ours alone to tread. Understanding the delicacy of the matter, Elizabeth offered a reassuring smile. Your efforts on their behalf will not sway my decision regarding us, but as Jane's sister, I would be remiss not to advocate for her happiness. At his subsequent mentioning of visiting her upon her arrival in town, she asked, Mr. Darcy, do you dare call on me in Sheepside? To do so must surely give rise to an expectation of some understanding between us, would it not? Darcy's gaze held hers, unflinching yet filled with tenderness. Would that be so untenable? I truly believe we must take every precaution until we have my father's blessing before we announce our engagement to the rest of the world. Darcy nodded, recognizing the importance of her speech. Then I suppose you do not intend for me to accompany you from London to Hertfordshire. My father has already arranged to have a carriage to convey Jane and me from London to Hertfordshire at the appointed time, Elizabeth explained. Indeed, my younger sisters have made quite an event of it, for they plan to come as well. 
She paused, her expression wry as she envisioned Lydia and Kitty's antics. I can only imagine the chaos they intend to create, perhaps turning the journey into their own theatrical performance, replete with endless gossip and frivolous games. It is hard to suppose you will be in town without my being able to call on you. There is all the more reason for a hasty marriage by special license, thus allowing us to spend all of our time together. Perhaps it would be deemed acceptable if you came to my relations home in town with Mr. Bingley. After all, a visit from him is everyone's favorite wish. Darcy's expression grew serious. Again, we must ensure that what happens in our relationship is not dictated by Bingley and Miss Bennett's circumstances. Even if you are certain of your sister's feelings, I am not entirely convinced of Bingley's constancy. Elizabeth nodded. I understand your concerns, sir. I suggested the scheme merely as it aligns with our need for discretion. With a resolute look, he said, I cannot promise, but if it is possible, I will endeavor to call on you with Bingley before your departure. Barring that, do not be surprised to find me at your doorstep in Longbourn on the hills of your arrival. A thought struck Elizabeth, casting a shadow of apprehension across her features. She hesitated, then spoke with a hint of concern. How shall I endure the remaining days here in Kent under the watchful eyes of your aunt, Lady Catherine? Her formidable presence is daunting enough without the added burden of our secret. Mr. Darcy's eyes twinkled with a mixture of admiration and concern. I have every confidence in your ability to hold your own, even against the formidable Lady Catherine, he replied, his voice warm with affection. But remember, should you require any aid, I am but an urgent missive away. Elizabeth's expression softened. I shall keep that in mind, she said, her spirits lifted by his supported words. Yet within her, a sense of trepidation lingered. The prospect of facing Lady Catherine de Bourgh, known for her domineering disposition and sharp opinions, was palpable. Their conversation drew to a close with a mutual understanding. As they prepared to part ways, Mr. Darcy said, I will probably see you once more before I leave Kent. My cousin, the colonel, is unaware of our engagement, and I intend to keep it that way for now. Should my suspicions prove correct, I shall attend to my loquacious cousin later. Your secret is safe with me, Mr. Darcy. Seizing her hand in his and kissing her palm, he whispered, Our secret, Elizabeth. Chapter 7 To Elizabeth's Dismay her plans for an early departure from that part of the country had reached Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Indeed, while she was packing her things, Mr. Collins arrived at the parsonage, panting and disheveled. He breathlessly explained that he felt compelled by his duty to her ladyship to inform her of Elizabeth's inexplicable change of plans. Anxiously, he relayed Lady Catherine's demands for a private audience with his cousin at Rosings. Soon after that, Elizabeth approached the Grand Estate with a sense of foreboding. She was immediately ushered into Lady Catherine's opulent drawing room. With an air of aggrieved authority, the noblewoman wasted no time addressing the matter at hand. First, I am deprived of the company of my beloved nephews, particularly Mr. Darcy, who continues to neglect his obligations toward my daughter Anne, Lady Catherine began, her voice evidencing her displeasure. And now, Miss Bennet, I hear you intend to leave us prematurely. What is the meaning of this sudden change? Given the change in my circumstances, I feel it best to return home sooner than originally intended. Change in circumstances? What has dictated such an abrupt departure when you were meant to remain here for another two weeks? I am afraid it is of a more personal nature, one I am not at liberty to discuss. With her eagle eyes scrutinizing Elizabeth, the air in the room grew tense. Then, with a perceptiveness sharpened by suspicion, she said, I cannot help but wonder if your hastened departure has anything to do with one of my nephews, perhaps even Mr. Darcy himself. I sincerely hope that is not the case. I am no stranger to the fact that my nephew Darcy called on you the evening you, under the guise of suffering a headache, assured your obligation to accompany the Collinses to Rosings, as inappropriate as his behavior was in calling on a single young lady. Being the honorable man I know him to be, I overlooked the impropriety. No doubt he meant to inquire about your health, but I fear you may have mistaken his intentions and relied on your feminine arts and allurements to draw him in. And when that did not work out quite as you planned, you have decided to throw yourself in his path in London. As much as Elizabeth endeavored to mask her feelings, she feared her countenance may have betrayed her. Her silence merely encouraged Lady Catherine to continue. 
if you are indeed pursuing my nephew darcy be warned miss bennett such aspirations are not only inappropriate but will lead to your social ruin the union between mr darcy and my daughter has long been expected and i will not allow it to be disrupted by a young woman of your low standing elizabeth recalled waving to mr burke and her companion earlier she was no longer surprised only the latter returned the greeting elizabeth wondered if mr burke harbored the same sentiments as her mother was she expecting mr darcy's proposal would she blame elizabeth for any ensuing heartbreak and what of mr darcy's young sister or even colonel fitzwilliam for that matter what manner of familiar harmony awaited her will it be as untenable as this with every interaction filled with tension suspicion and hidden resentment maintaining her composure under lady catherine's penetrating stare elizabeth chose her words with care neither confirming nor denying the suspicions laid before her this reluctance only fueled lady catherine's ire oh come now do not try to deceive me this sudden departure clearly follows the leave-taking of my nephew you aim to catch him in your sly nets by batting those fine eyes has my nephew given you reason to hope tell me the truth color fluttered her face at the accusations still elizabeth held her tongue despite any grievances held by lady catherine she would not betray her understanding with mr darcy i must caution you miss bennett her voice rising with each syllable if you dare to set your sights on my nephew darcy mark my words you are embarking on a path fraught with disappointment he is destined for a match far more advantageous than an alliance with the daughter of a mere country gentleman the constancy of affection shines brightest amid society's thundering dissent elizabeth offered a polite but vague explanation about family matters necessitating her early return however lady catherine with her astute and suspicious nature would not be so easily dissuaded tell me at once miss bennett what i insist upon knowing why the very idea of someone of your low standing aspiring to attach herself to my nephew is most unsettling you are entitled to your opinion just as you are free to espouse conjecture and innuendo of your own choosing but i am under no obligation to justify or explain my decision to leave kent to you you dare speak to me in such a manner have you no respect for your elders or you impudent girl if what i suspect is true miss bennett be warned pursuing mr darcy is a futile endeavour his duties and responsibilities lie elsewhere and i shall not tolerate any attempts to divert him from his true purposes elizabeth willed herself to remain expressionless though her heart thudded at the accusation would the woman's haughtiness stoop to prying into the gentleman's private affairs apparently so for lady catherine's eyes narrowed oh come now girl i see the guilt written on your face clearly you are hiding something from me elizabeth hesitated alarmed at how near to the mark her ladyship's words struck before she could fashion a response the older woman barreled on he is already promised to another as you well know i will not have you interfering and sullying his good name again elizabeth held her tongue her cheeks flaming in indignation the woman's arrogant assumptions were insufferable she silently reminded herself that she must endure this torment a while longer before being free of lady catherine's reach you would do well to remember your station miss bennett lady catherine continued she scoffed you insolent girl have you so little concern for propriety that you would entrap a gentleman of mr darcy's consequence and for what financial security social standing i assure you miss bennett i will not allow you to snare my nephew without a fight despite the verbal onslaught elizabeth held firm clarity settling over her like sunlight emerging from the clouds nothing lady catherine could say would change the path elizabeth and darcy were destined to take this conviction fortified her carriage as she withstood the rest of lady catherine's ranting with stoic poise indeed this interrogation was a blessing in disguise lady catherine's words only bolstered elizabeth's resolve she would marry whom she wished and the one she wished to was kind honourable mr darcy this settled comfortably in her breast elizabeth endured the rest of her ladyship's tirade with fortitude elizabeth would return to hertfordshire to seek her father's blessings and once secured bind herself for ever to the man fate has selected just for her chapter eight darcy house 
London, England. Fueled by concern and indignation, Lady Catherine de Bourgh hastened to London the day after Elizabeth Bennet's departure. Arriving at Darcy House, she intended to confront her nephew Fitzwilliam Darcy, persuaded as she was that the impertinent young woman had followed him to town, planning to use her feminine charms to make him forget what he was about. Her mind was a whirlwind of anxious meditations, each more disquieting than the last, regarding the perceived danger that the young woman posed to her family's distinguished standing in society. She was resolute in her determination to safeguard her nephew from what she saw as his possible ruin. Upon her arrival, Lady Catherine was shown into Darcy's study, a room that exuded its owner's quiet dignity and refined taste. Darcy, looking every bit the master of the house, greeted his aunt with a pleasant nod, masking the apprehension that her unexpected visit had stirred within him. Lady Catherine, to what do I owe the honor of your presence? And so soon upon the heels of my leave-taking Rosings Park. Mind you, nephew, if your questioning my being here is out of sincerity, then I was right in coming as expeditiously as I did, for it means there is still time to prevent that impertinent young woman who intruded upon my good graces these past weeks in Kent from having her way. Impertinent young woman, do not frame ignorance with me. You can have no doubt of whom I am speaking. You know the frankness of my character, and in a cause of such a moment as this, I shall certainly not depart from it. I know you called upon Miss Bennet the evening before you took your leave of Kent. I also know you well enough to know your reasons were well intended, but I fear that in doing so, you have inadvertently taught that young woman to hope, to aspire to a position far beyond her sphere. Though she refused to confess it when I called her out on her irrational expectations, a woman of my discernment knows when duplicity and deception are afoot. Do you mean to say you confronted Miss Elizabeth with your suspicions? What were you thinking? Indeed, I confronted her. What else would I do upon learning that she planned to leave Kent mere days after you left, when she was meant to remain for another two weeks? Knowing how the minds of scheming young ladies and want of rich husbands work, it required little in the way of conjecture to know she meant to come to town and surmise a means of throwing herself in your path. Was that not the same scheme her eldest sister employed in her egregious attempt to trap your friend Charles Bingley? Darcy felt a pain of regret recalling his role in separating Elizabeth's eldest sister and his friend, and how it had almost cost him everything his heart desired. As Lady Catherine continued her speech, Darcy's mind wandered momentarily to Elizabeth. He pictured her fine eyes the curve of her smile, and how her laughter filled the room. He thought of their conversations while in Hertfordshire and Kent, the intellectual sparring that had become a dance of minds, and his growing admiration for her strength and integrity. These thoughts starkly contrasted with his aunt's words, which painted Elizabeth as a scheming opportunist. Lady Catherine's sharp and unyielding voice brought him back to the present. She spoke of family, duty, and societal expectations, reminding him of his supposed obligation to marry within their social circle, preferably his cousin Anne. Darcy long felt the familiar tug of these responsibilities, the expectations he had been raised to fulfill. Yet, as he listened, a sense of defiance swelled within him. Lady Catherine's words echoed in the stately room, but they failed to reach the depths of his soul, which Elizabeth's spirit and intellect had irreversibly touched. Each sentence from his aunt deepened the divide between his familial obligations and his desires. Even in the face of duty's stern intrusion, love boldly defies. Standing tall before his aunt, Darcy felt the weight of his family's history pressing upon him, not only the Darcy lineage, but the Fitzwilliam lineage as well. The former steeped in spans of generational wealth, as powerful landowners, and the latter in the aristocracy, had always dictated a specific path for him. When Lady Catherine paused, her eyes piercing and expectant, Darcy resolved to end all such interferences from that point on. Lady Catherine, he began, his voice steady, despite the tumult inside him, I have always valued your guidance and the care you have shown for our family's welfare. However, I must be true to myself. I cannot and will not bind myself to a life devoid of affection for the sake of tradition alone. 
and I certainly will not marry my cousin Anne. For heaven's sake, put this notion of an engagement between us out of your mind. It was never going to happen, despite whatever plans you and my mother may have envisioned while Anne and I were in our cradles. Lady Catherine, taken aback by his fervor, struggled to comprehend this defiance. Her nephew, whom she had always seen as a paragon of propriety and duty, now stood before her, a man driven by his own desires, dare even lust, to her way of thinking. You owe it to our family, to your own name, to choose a wife who will elevate our standing, not diminish it, she asserted. How dare you dismiss your mother's intentions for you in such a callous manner? You speak as if there is some validity to my suspicions that Miss Bennet may have drawn you in. Can this be true? Can you possibly, in a moment of weakness, have allowed yourself to abandon all modicum of honor and responsibility that our family has spent years instilling in you? She asked, pray tell me anything, but there is some foundation in my suspicions regarding that young woman. Tell me you have not purposely increased that little upstart's expectations. Lady Catherine, again, I am well aware of our family's legacy and the responsibilities it entails. I respect our proud heritage, but I cannot and will not sacrifice my happiness for it. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, though not of our social standing, is a woman of intelligence, grace, and virtue. She embodies the qualities that would bring true happiness to any man's life. Addressing his aunt with the firmness that broke no argument, he continued, and if I were fortunate enough to earn her favor, and dare I say, her heart, I would consider myself the luckiest of men. Stunned by his words, Lady Catherine was momentarily speechless. His declaration was a bold testament to his feelings for Elizabeth, a stance that defied his aunt's expectations and societal norms. Fitzwilliam, you cannot be serious, she declared. To forsake your duty for a momentary fancy? Think of your reputation. A match with Miss Bennet is not only imprudent, but unthinkable. I am sorry you feel that way, but in such a case as this, it will not dissuade me from my purposes, whatever they may or may not be. And this is your honest opinion? This is your final resolve? Very well. I shall know how to act. Do not imagine, nephew, that your ambition will ever be gratified. I came to warn you, to protect you. I hoped to find you sensible but depend upon it, I will carry my point. I promise to do everything in my power to thwart such a union. If you will not hear reason, I dare say I know of someone who will, possibly the one person in the world who can compel that headstrong girl to see reason. What on earth does that mean? That, dear nephew, is for me to know, she said ominously. No doubt you will find out once I have accomplished what I shall set out to do. In a flurry, Lady Catherine ran it on and on until she reached the door of Darcy's study. She halted at the door, unable to bear the disappointment that her nephew was not heeding her warnings. I have no patience for your insolence, nephew. I am most seriously displeased, she declared before turning away, too upset to look back at him. With that, she stormed out, leaving Darcy alone, more vexed than worried about her disapproval. Hours later, in the quiet aftermath of the confrontation, Darcy looked out the window, the streets bustling below. Her ladyship's veiled threat plagued his mind. The one person in the world? Who does she mean to prevail on? It was all he could do not to call on Elizabeth and Cheapside, mindful of her wishes to conceal the engagement until they had secured her father's blessings. He did not. With his friend Charles Bingley, away from London, attending to family matters in Scarborough, he had no choice but to wait and visit her in Hertfordshire as per their original plan. Surely Elizabeth was safe from his aunt. Lady Catherine had confessed to confronting Elizabeth while in Kent, and other than the Collinses, he knew of no other mutual acquaintances whom his aunt might prevail on. A disturbing prospect immediately crossed his mind. Surely Lady Catherine does not mean to seek out Elizabeth's father in Hertfordshire. Chapter 9, Longbourn Village, Hertfordshire, England. Move out of my way. Where is Mr. Bennett? The Bennets exchanged puzzled glances as an alarmed Hill hastily entered the parlor. She curtsied deeply as Lady Catherine swept past in a rustle of silk skirts. 
What could bring such a person racing to their home unannounced and uninvited? No doubt such was the question on everyone's mind. If Lady Catherine felt any awkwardness at the irregular circumstances, she did not show it. Planting her cane firmly, she scanned the room imperiously until alighting on Mr. Bennet. Not condescending to stand on ceremony in such a place as this, she charged forward without preamble. The stately lady strode toward Mr. Bennet. There you are, sir. I have come all this way to apprise you of some alarming information about your daughter, Miss Elizabeth. Raising a bushy brow, the gentleman calmly set aside his paper and rose to offer an abbreviated bow. Lady Catherine de Bourgh, so you know who I am? I assure you, your ladyship, I do indeed. Your reputation precedes you, said Mr. Bennet. In view of Mr. Collins's sycophantic exaltations and his favorite daughter's telling letters, who else could it be? There is all the more reason to dispense with any unnecessary civilities. Welcome to Longbourn all the same, Lady Catherine. Pray allow me to present my wife, Mrs. Bennet, and our daughter, Miss Mary. His tone implied more amusement than deference at her blustering entrance. The two ladies curtsied, their heads bowed in a gesture of utmost respect towards the aristocrat. Lady Catherine said, You have a very small garden. Mrs. Bennet nodded. Compared to the gardens at Rosings Park, I am sure you are correct, but it is much larger than the garden at Lucas Lodge. Mr. Bennet said, Our Lizzie wrote to us extolling the magnificent gardens and lanes at your home. He gestured to a nearby sofa and continued, Pray, make yourself comfortable. Lady Catherine scoffed and threw a glance about the room. Speaking of home, where is your daughter? Or do I even have to ask? For no doubt she remains in town, scheming to throw herself in the path of my esteemed nephew, Mr. Darcy. Hence my coming here. I mean to appeal to you to make her see reason before it is too late. Mr. Bennet stroked his beard thoughtfully. Clearly, Lady Catherine believed wholeheartedly in her own words. Yet he knew his Lizzie had little fondness for the aloof Mr. Darcy, from what everyone knew of him from his time spent in Hertfordshire. What was behind these wild accusations? He narrowed his eyes, carefully examining the agitated noblewoman, determined to uncover every detail of her improbable tale. The Bennet ladies exchanged astonished glances, well aware of Elizabeth's prior dislike of the proud Mr. Darcy. Hence, when Lady Catherine demanded Mr. Bennet write to his misguided daughter post-haste to dissuade her from her purpose, Mrs. Bennet chuckled. What utter nonsense, your ladyship. Our Lizzie despises your Mr. Darcy. Indeed, she said only last month how proud and disagreeable he is with his ten thousand pounds a year and a grand estate far away in Derbyshire, wherever that is. Is that not correct, Mary? Her third-born daughter, Mary, could not be prevailed on to comment preferring instead to feign more interest in the pages of her book than was called for at such a time as this. As for the haughty gentleman, why, he scarcely paid more notice to Lizzie than any other lady last autumn. Mrs. Bennet pressed her hand to her bosom. It cannot be. Lizzie would never give consequence to such a disagreeable man. Despite her words, her eyes held a spark of intrigue at the thought of such a wealthy suitor. Mr. Bennet looked on silently as his wife dissolved into exclamations. Other than to express her desire to cut her visit with the Collinses short, no such letter had arrived from his favorite daughter conveying this intelligence. Elizabeth and her sisters were due back from London soon enough. While Lady Catherine's claims seemed far-fetched, given Elizabeth's prior sentiments toward Darcy, Mr. Bennet understood his daughter's lively mind and passionate disposition better than most. He would reserve judgment until hearing the whole truth from Elizabeth herself. Stroking his bearded chin pensively, he met Lady Catherine's enraged glare. I confess you have piqued my interest with this tale, madam. Pray continue. Lady Catherine was more than happy to oblige. I am no stranger to the machinations of your eldest daughter. How she meant to ensnare young Charles Bingley. But fortunately, his family would not allow it and did everything in their power to separate them before it was too late. Is there any wonder, I would conclude, that your next eldest daughter would employ the same tactics by setting her sights on my nephew, using her feminine wiles to draw him in? Is there any wonder I am here to protect him in the same spirit that the Bingleys protected their relation from such an unequal, disgraceful, despicable alliance? Amid Mrs. Bennet's continued protests against such absurdities, 
A scowling Lady Catherine oriented herself to take in the entire family. I suppose you have all been kept ignorant of the truth, else you would not dare to feign such innocence. But the fact remains, your daughter has cast a net meant to trap my nephew, Mr. Darcy, and I shall not abide it. Mr. Bennet said, your coming all this way must signify you believe what you are espousing, which brings to my mind the question of what you intend for me to do about it. From what I know of your nephew, he is more than capable of fending for himself. He surely does not need you to do his bidding. If you knew my character, then you would know that I am not one to be trifled with, Lady Catherine declared in response to the undignified impertinence she was receiving. Your daughter has set her sights on a gentleman who may be reasonably looked up to as one of the most illustrious personages in this land, a fortunate young man, blessed with all that a mortal heart could desire, a splendid estate, esteemed lineage, and advantageous connections. Despite all these temptations, you must warn your daughter against the dangers of her chosen path. Mr. Bennet was tempted to laugh out loud, concluding as he did that Lady Catherine was mad. Mr. Darcy never looked at any woman but to see a blemish, and probably never looked at a Lizzie in his life. It is admirable. True love speaks loudest against meddling's discordant notes. Before long, the confusion was compounded by yet another unexpected visitor. Mr. Darcy stepped into the parlor, his countenance solemn, his dark eyes stormy, with hints of determination and distress. Uncertainty shifted to dawning realization on the master of Longbourn's face. Clearly, there is more than the idle speculations of an officious woman at play. Mr. Bennet rose from his seat. Mr. Darcy, the younger man, threw his elder an apologetic look, accompanied by a respectful bow. Mr. Bennet, Mrs. Bennet, pray, forgive my aunt's intrusion. He shot her ladyship a quailing glare. Lady Catherine, he said, his voice a controlled but stern rebuke, I must insist you cease this unwarranted interference into matters that do not concern you. Lady Catherine, taken aback, bristled at the reprimand. Fitzwilliam, your insolence is most unbecoming, she replied angrily. Lady Catherine, might I have a word with you in privacy? You have overstepped. Her frustration unmistakable, she said, as I am here to protect you from unintentionally aligning yourself with the likes of these people, there is nothing you can say to me that you cannot say before them. Mr. Darcy's jaw tightened. Very well, then, he said, his voice low but steady. If you insist on airing our grievances in this manner, so be it. But I warn you, your ladyship, you will not like the consequences. Lady Catherine scoffed. And what consequences might those be, nephew? Have you lost sight of what you are about? Darcy squared his shoulder, a fire burning in his eyes as he spoke with spirited determination. No, Lady Catherine, I have not, but it is clear that you have. You claim to act out of concern for my well-being and reputation, but in truth, your actions are driven by nothing more than arrogance and self-importance. The room held its breath as Darcy's words hung in the air. The tension between nephew and aunt palpable. Lady Catherine's lips twisted into a sneer as she glared at him. Her haughty demeanor momentarily faltered. You dare to accuse me of such motives, she cried, her voice dripping with indignation. I have been like a mother to you since the passing of my beloved sister, Lady Anne, bestowing upon you unwavering love and support. And this is how you repay me? Darcy's voice remained steady, betraying none of the turmoil within his heart. You mistake gratitude for blind obedience, Aunt Catherine. I have no doubt you love me in your own way, but that does not grant you the right to dictate whom I should love or marry. May I remind you of the conversation we had in town when you warned me against the connection with Miss Elizabeth Bennet, and I told you that were I to be fortunate enough to win her favor, and most importantly, her heart, I would be most honored. What I did not tell you, because frankly, it can have nothing to do with you, is that I have already fallen in love with Miss Elizabeth, most ardently, and I offered my hand to her when we were together in Kent. A ripple of shock swept through the room. Mary closed her book, and 
Mrs. Bennet gasped while Mr. Bennet's eyes widened in disbelief. Lady Catherine's jaw dropped open, stunned into silence for a moment, before she found her voice once more. This is preposterous. You cannot possibly be serious about marrying her. Think of everything you would sacrifice. Darcy's voice remained firm as he countered Lady Catherine's objections. I have thought of everything, your ladyship. Love is not a sacrifice. It is a blessing. Miss Bennet has captured my heart like no other woman ever has. I cannot deny my feelings for her, nor would I wish to. Lady Catherine's face grew paler with each passing second. You are throwing away everything for the sake of that country girl? A family of no consequence or fortune? Darcy's eyes blazed with determination as he stepped closer to his aunt. Miss Elizabeth's worth is not defined by her family's wealth or social standing. She possesses qualities that are far more valuable than material riches, intelligence, wit, and a strength of character that is unmatched. Lady Catherine struggled to regain her composure amid this unexpected turn of events. This, this cannot be. I will not allow it. Mr. Bennett glanced at his wife with a mixture of surprise and amusement before turning his attention to the younger man. Well, Mr. Darcy, he said, a faint smirk playing on his lips. It appears that you have managed to scandalize our household, but I must admit your declaration has piqued my curiosity. Mrs. Bennett, who had been rendered speechless until now, found her voice and injected in an astonished tone. Did I hear you correctly, Mr. Darcy? You proposed to Lizzie? Darcy turned his attention toward Mrs. Bennett, his face softening with sincerity. Yes, Mrs. Bennett, I proposed to your daughter. Mrs. Bennett let out an exuberant squeal as she excitedly squeezed her husband's arm. Mr. Bennett stared, his expression a combination of surprise and newfound respect. Lady Catherine interrupted their exchange with an indignant snort. This is madness, she exclaimed, regaining some of her composure. You cannot possibly marry beneath you, Darcy. It would be a scandal. Mrs. Bennett paid Lady Catherine's admonitions no mind. For heaven's sake, Mr. Darcy, pray. Do not keep us in suspense. What did our Lizzie say? Chapter 10 Elizabeth's sensibilities went from excitement to vexation upon arriving at Longbourn Village. The sight of Lady Catherine's grand carriage, adorned with its opulent crest, alongside the less ostentatious, yet unmistakably elegant carriage of her intended, stirred in her a mixture of apprehension and curiosity. She had half expected to see Mr. Darcy's carriage. However, the presence of Lady Catherine's carriage took her entirely by surprise. Why on earth had Lady Catherine traveled to Hertfordshire, and ahead of Mr. Darcy no less, if one were to judge by the arrangement of the carriages? Had they made the journey together? It was quite impossible to surmise. Having confided the news of her betrothal to Mr. Darcy to her sister Jane, Elizabeth shot the latter a worried glance. Jane's countenance reflected as much confusion as Elizabeth's. The two younger sisters, excited about the prospect of returning to Longbourn amid a household of distinguished guests, were perched at the edge of their seats. Kitty and Lydia, in their usual high spirits, chattered incessantly, weaving fanciful tales about the visitors. Perhaps the Queen of England herself has come to bestow her grand blessings upon us, Lydia exclaimed with a giggle to which Kitty responded with a dreamy sigh. Or maybe she is here to announce a grand ball at court, and we are all invited. With her last encounter with Lady Catherine de Bourgh lingering in her mind, Elizabeth half wished her silly sister's fanciful imaginings were true. She wasted little time descending the carriage and rushed inside Longbourn. As Elizabeth entered the parlor, her eyes immediately found Mr. Darcy. He stood tall and poised, his demeanor calm, yet his eyes searching. Having heard her mother's plea mere seconds prior, Elizabeth felt her heart race as she realized the gravity of the situation. With all eyes fixed upon her, she mustered her carriage and, with the grace that belied her inner turmoil, said, Yes, I said yes. I have accepted Mr. Darcy's proposal. A collective gasp filled the room. Jane's eyes sparkled with glee while Kitty and Lydia exchanged excited glances, barely containing their enthusiasm, as though they had indeed received an invitation to a grand ball. Mary's book fell to the floor. 
Mr. Bennett looked stunned, his eyes shifting between Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy, as though trying to comprehend the reasoning of the matter, sensing the undercurrents of a complex narrative unfolding before him. Well, this is a most unexpected turn of events. Mr. Darcy, Lizzie, he said, his tone severe, yet tended with a characteristic wryness. Would either of you care to enlighten us on the nature of this dramatic change in fortunes? Elizabeth glanced at Darcy, their eyes locked in silent understanding. She took a deep breath. Papa, I... Mr. Darcy and I came to an understanding while in Kent. Darcy stepped closer to Elizabeth, his stance protective yet respectable. Indeed, sir, I have asked for Miss Elizabeth's hand in marriage, and she has graciously consented. Mr. Bennet scrutinized them closely, his eyes shifting from Elizabeth's slightly trembling form to Darcy's earnest, hopeful expression. Elizabeth's busy mind raced with thoughts. What if he does not consent? What if he thinks poorly of my choice? Will he think I have taken leave of my senses to accept the man whom I once vowed to loathe? How earnestly did she wish her former opinions had been more reasonable, her expressions more moderate? It would have spared her from explanations and professions which were exceedingly awkward to give. The room seemed to hold its breath, waiting for Mr. Bennett's response. After a moment that felt like an eternity, he nodded slowly. Well, then, he said, it seems we have much to discuss. Lady Catherine could not agree more with Mr. Bennett's sentiment. As she watched the scene unfold before her, a smug smile tugged at the corners of her mouth. This was precisely what she had hoped for, an opportunity to intervene and set Elizabeth on the right path. With an air of authority, Lady Catherine cleared her throat, commanding the attention of everyone in the room. Mr. Bennet, she began condescendingly, it is clear that your daughter has acted upon a misguided notion. She cannot possibly comprehend the implications of such a rash decision. You must explain to her the ways of the world and why a union with my nephew can never be. Elizabeth turned to face Lady Catherine, her eyes filled with defiance. I assure you, your ladyship, I have considered my decision carefully and without any trace of misunderstanding. All eyes shifted between the two women. It was a battle of wills, a clash of two strong-minded individuals who refused to back down. Lady Catherine stepped closer to Elizabeth, her eyes narrowing with disapproval. Miss Bennet, you must understand that certain expectations come with marrying into a family such as Mr. Darcy's. You cannot simply dismiss them. Elizabeth stood tall, refusing to be intimidated. I am well aware of the responsibilities and expectations that come with marriage, Lady Catherine. Rest assured, I shall do everything in my power to fulfill them. Of course you will, my child. Oh, I knew you could not be so clever for nothing. Mrs. Bennet, unable to contain her excitement, clasped her hands together, her eyes sparkling with unbridled joy. Oh, Mr. Darcy, she explained, you have made us the happiest of families. To think, my Lizzie, the future mistress of Pemberley, her mind whirled with delightful visions of grand balls and esteemed society gatherings. We are most honored, most delighted. You have made an excellent choice, sir, in my Lizzie. She will make a fine mistress of your magnificent home. Her approbations tumbled out in a flurry, each one signifying the thrill of a mother's pride at the prospect of a daughter so well settled. Lady Catherine, however, remained unimpressed, her lips pursed in disapproval. It is all too clear, she declared, her voice dripping with disdain. The motives that guide such an alliance, with your modest means and low connections, you Bennets have long sought to improve your situation through advantageous marriages. Catching the slight change in Darcy's expression, Elizabeth quickly stated, It is not Mr. Darcy's wealth, nor his standing, that is one my regard, but rather his excellent principles and caring heart. Her voice was soft but firm, and her eyes shone with affection as she glanced toward Darcy. Well, it is only proper to acknowledge the many virtues of my nephew. Few men of his standing would display such magnanimity. She declared, her tone affirming she considered Elizabeth an unworthy recipient of such a match. I promise you that to go forth with this union places you in grave danger of being censored and scorned by everyone who is anyone. Do not expect to be noticed by his family or friends if you willfully act against the inclinations of all. Everyone connected with him will censor, slight, and despise you. 
Your alliance will be a disgrace. Your name will never be mentioned by any of us. These are heavy misfortunes, replied Elizabeth. But the wife of Mr. Darcy must have such extraordinary sources of happiness attached to her situation that she could, upon the whole, have no cause to repine. Arrogance clatters, but the heart's resolve whispers true. Mr. Darcy's eyes softened at her declaration. He looked at her as if she were the only person in the room, the only person in the world. His eyes spoke volumes, conveying a deep feeling that words could not capture. You are then resolved to have him? Indeed, I am resolved to act in that manner which, in my own opinion, constitute my happiness without reference to you or any person so wholly unconnected to me. You refuse then to oblige me? You refuse to obey the claims of society, honor, and gratitude? And you are determined to ruin him in the opinion of his friends and make him the contempt of the world? Neither duty, honor, nor gratitude have any claim on me in the present instance. No principle of either would be violated by my marriage to Mr. Darcy. And regarding the resentment of his family or the world's indignation, if the former were excited by his marrying me, it would not give me one moment's concern, and the world in general would have too much sense to join in the scorn. And this is how you mean to repay me for allowing you into my home and bestowing upon you my munificence? Very well. I shall know how to act. I came to try you, all of you. At the very least, I had hoped to find your father reasonable, but depend upon it, you have not heard the last of me. In this manner, Lady Catherine walked on till she was at the door, when, turning hastily around and aiming her cane at no one in particular, she declared, I take no leave of you any of you. None of you deserve such attention. I have never been more disgusted during my entire life. Chapter 11. Good riddance, no doubt, was the unspoken consensus written on everyone's face when they heard the door slam. Mr. Bennet, having observed the unfolding scene with both astonishment and contemplation, leaned back in his chair, his eyes unreadable as they rested on Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy and the room was thick with anticipation, awaiting his next word. After a moment that stretched on like an eternity, he cleared his throat. Mr. Darcy, Lizzie, he began, his voice measured. It is evident to me, despite the unexpected nature of this match, that you both possess a genuine regard for each other. He paused, his eyes shifted between his daughter and her suitor. Lizzie, my child, you have always been a daughter of independent thought and spirit. And, Mr. Darcy, your actions today speak of a man of true character and integrity. Elizabeth held her breath, her heart pounding in her chest. She searched her father's face for any sign of disapproval or hesitation. A tender smile reached her father's eyes. Therefore, with a full heart, I give you my consent and blessing. May your journey together be filled with happiness. Relief and joy washed over Elizabeth like the sun's warm rays breaking through the clouds after a storm. She felt a weight lift from her shoulders, her heart soaring with the acceptance and approval of her beloved father. Mr. Bennett continued, Though the path to this moment has been somewhat circuitous, clearly two hearts have found their way home. At that moment, the room seemed to breathe a collective sigh of relief. The tension in the air dissipated, replaced by familiar harmony and felicity. Darcy and Elizabeth exchanged a glance, a silent promise, as they stood on the threshold of a new life together. A smile graced Elizabeth's lips as she met her father's gaze, her eyes shining with unshed tears of glee. She knew her father valued her happiness above societal conventions, and his approval meant the world to her. Standing beside Elizabeth, Darcy felt a profound gratitude toward Mr. Bennet. Visibly moved, he bowed his head respectfully. Thank you, sir, he said earnestly. I assure you, I hold your daughter's happiness above all else, and I am committed to being a husband worthy of her. Mr. Bennet nodded. I believe you, Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth and Darcy exchanged a tender look, their hands finding each other's, both suffering, an overwhelming sense of belonging. The room hummed with enthusiasm as the Bennet family celebrated the joyous occasion. Even Mary, ever the astute observer, allowed herself a contented smile while Kitty and Lydia danced about the room in excitement. Mr. Bennet, ever perceptive, 
and mindful of what it was like to find oneself in the throes of ardent admiration cleared his throat, drawing their attention back to him. Now, future Mr. and Mrs. Darcy, he said, with a twinkle in his eye, I believe it is time for the two of you to take a moment alone. No doubt you have much to discuss and plan for your future. Amid life's vicissitudes, a felicitous alliance discovers its gratifying confirmation. Elizabeth nodded eagerly, her heart swelling with gratitude for her father's consideration and support. She squeezed Darcy's hand gently before they went outside the manor house to the garden. As they walked, Elizabeth could feel Mr. Darcy's eyes fixed on her, filled with an intensity she had come to recognize as his unwavering devotion. His touch was reassuring against her trembling fingers. Once they found themselves in a quiet alcove, where the sounds of celebration were muffled, Elizabeth turned to face Darcy. Her father's approval lifted any lingering doubts she might have had, leaving her with a renewed sense of confidence. Mr. Darcy, what happens now? What shall we do next? Elizabeth, he began, his voice full of tenderness and vulnerability, barely above a whisper. There is something I have wanted to do from almost the first moment I realized I was in grave danger of falling in love with you. Elizabeth's eyes widened, curiosity dancing within them. Do tell, she said, her voice filled with eagerness and anticipation. He leaned closer. I have longed to kiss you, he said, his tender words conveying his deep longing and fervent adoration. May I? With a shy smile, she nodded, granting him permission. Intensity filled the air as Darcy closed the distance between them, his eyes never leaving hers. Their lips brushed together softly, tentatively at first, as if testing the waters of their newfound connection. But as their kiss deepened, Elizabeth's hands found their way to Darcy's broad chest, tracing each breath as it rose and fell in perfect harmony with her own. His arms encircled her waist, pulling her even closer. Their souls danced in unison as they lost themselves in the sweet embrace. It was as if the world around them had faded away. When they finally broke apart, Elizabeth's cheeks were flushed and her breath came in ragged gasps. She peered into Darcy's eyes, seeing the reflection of their sheer desire mirrored within his gaze. To Elizabeth's way of thinking, the kiss was everything she secretly dreamed it would be. Darcy brushed a strand of hair away from her face. My dearest, loveliest Elizabeth, mere words fail me as I endeavor to express my profound admiration for you. I vow to honor and protect you with every fiber of my being from this second until the end of time, he promised. And leaning in once more, he sealed his avowal with a kiss. Epilogue. Happy was the day Mrs. Bennet got rid of her second daughter, and as the wedding had been the means of reuniting her eldest with Mr. Charles Bingley, the eager mamma's happiness was almost complete. Surely Mr. Bingley did not mean to break Jane's heart all over again. No doubt there would be a wedding at Netherfield in under three months. There was some disappointment to be suffered on the lady's part when her younger daughter's trip to Brighton as the guest of the young bride of the colonel of the militia did not unfold, for Mrs. Bennet was sure that Lydia would find herself a husband, perhaps even an officer, but with connections as advantageous as the new Mrs. Darcy's marriage afforded the Bennets, she could not on the whole have any genuine cause to repine. Indeed, what was the purpose of having such lofty connections if not to throw the other girls in the path of rich husbands? The dissemination of the news of Elizabeth's engagement was promptly followed by the arrival of the Collinses at Lucas Lodge. The reason for this sudden removal was all too evident. Lady Catherine had been so exceedingly angered by her nephew's defiance that Charlotte, really rejoicing in the match, was anxious to get away from Kent until the storm was blown over. Lady Catherine de Bourgh was not the only person determined to be unhappy about Mr. Darcy's marriage. Young Mr. Bingley's sister was most seriously displeased as well. What kindred spirits the two ladies turned out to be, both thinking that the scheming upstart Elizabeth Bennet had entrapped Mr. Darcy with her feminine wiles. However, neither of the women wished to forego the rights of visiting Pemberley. In the case of Miss Bingley, she paid off every arrear of civility to Elizabeth to protect her interests. 
Her ladyship employed the excuse of being Mr. Darcy's favorite aunt as a means of intruding on the couple's felicity, until, after a little further resistance on her part, her resentment gave way either to her genuine affection for her nephew or her curiosity to see how his wife conducted herself. As for Mr. Darcy's other relations, most notably his sister, Miss Darcy, and his cousins, Anne and Colonel Fitzwilliam, Elizabeth needed not to have worried about their acceptance. Nothing pleased young Miss Darcy more than finally having a sister. Anne was relieved that all such prognostications of a predestined alliance with her cousin were finally put to rest. Last but not least, any misgivings either Elizabeth or Darcy may have had toward the colonel had given way to forgiveness and faded into distant memories. Colonel Fitzwilliam was grateful that his inadvertent revelation to Elizabeth back in the verdant lanes of Kent had not thwarted his cousin's favorite wish. In fact, what had initially been a source of worry when Darcy called him out now seemed like a peculiar stroke of destiny. He had done his cousin a great service, had he not? Was it not far better that such unpleasant disclosures be revealed before the wedding? Indeed, he might very well congratulate himself for putting into play a succession of events that, one might argue, had been the means of uniting them. This has been Wait for Love, Expanded Edition, written and read by P. O. Dixon. Copyright 2024. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the story. If you did, please remember to like and subscribe and leave a comment. It's always a pleasure to connect with you here on YouTube.